So, um, hearing the black hole bug reports. And once again, my name is Carl Keane, and uh, I'm an automation engineer at RethinkDB. So, um, what we're talking about is how to write better bugs. And I've written a few, so I think I have some experience here. Um, and my answer really is don't write them. People don't, just don't like bugs. So, Q&A? I mean, this is a really short session, but you know. Okay, no, you don't smell first, you don't know. Okay. So apparently I have a bug in my slides. Um, so uh, we'll move on. How to write better bug reports. Notice this is 2.0 version, new and improved. Um, so same thing, nice artwork provided by our, our resident artist at Rethink TV. Um, a little bit about who I am and why I know something about this topic. Um, I started off as tech support in the University of Wisconsin moved to a few different places, wound up at the University of Pennsylvania, not Penn State, the other one, the one in Philadelphia. Um, I tr <coughs> slowly was transitioning from into imaging and databases while at UPenn, and then really picked that up going into Stanford, where I did Stanford's images uh, for the systems for a little while. While I was there, because of the needs, um, I took over maintaining InstaDMG, wrote Insta up to date, and some other stuff. Um, they uh, unfortunately had a round of layoffs, and I was last man in, so I was first man out. And uh, a few weeks after that, wound up at Apple, um, doing QA automation for them, primarily in a lab that supported OpenGL, OpenCL, although I did have a stint as one of the few Windows admins at Apple doing their uh, testing lab for, uh, um, op uh, for QuickTime. Uh, I have since moved on, and I'm now an automation engineer at RethinkDB. Like I said before, there is a startup company in software. Um, we make the RethinkDB database and the Horizon product. Oh, it is not. There we go. Um, yeah, a little bit louder now. Um, and that is an open source product. Um, so my goals for today are to explain what happens to your bug once you submit it. Um, highlight some of the people that are responsible for that, that process as it goes through, and to give you some pointers on how to make their job easier so your bugs make it through the process better, and they get fixed for you. Um, also some general advice about how to report bugs in general. Um, so what is a bug? Um, this is a really bad definition, but a bug is someone saying, I don't like that. Um, there really isn't a better, more concise definition for it because there's so many different things. So submitting bug reports. So for instance, if I click one more time, so iTunes eats your cat. You report it to Apple, you wait a while, you wait a little more, you wait a little bit more, and it finally it's closed as duplicate. Um, <laughs> I realize that this is the process that a lot of people go through. Um, and there is actually reason f behind this madness. Um, so, about more about bugs. Where do bugs come from? In my experience, they come from this guy right here. Uh, I kid, this is one of my coworkers. Uh, he's quite talented. But uh, we have a joke about that. Um, so, the type of bug reports that are submitted, some of them are about the functionality of the product. You know, an easy example would be it's crashing <laughs> when I start it up. Um, one special subcase of these are regressions, and this is an important one. I'll call it out a few times in, in this presentation. Regressions are something that used to work and now <coughs> don't. Um, they're important for a few different reasons. They're easier to fix. They tend to have higher priority within software organizations. Um, so it's important whenever your bug is a regression, to try to mark it as such, because you're going, it's going to get fixed better and faster. Um, there's the features and enhancements. Um, these are things that the product doesn't do, maybe has never done, that you want it to do. Another group is environmental. It crashes in my system. It doesn't do this in my system. Um, and it's often important to separate both for you and for people on the other side, that this doesn't work in my system, but this works somewhere else. Um, I'll mention this later, but I'll give a teaser on this one, works on 17. Um, there's also a variant of that, a workflow problem. I'm connecting from your product to that product, and it doesn't work. 
This one's an important one to note, it's because it, it's one of those that often gets flagged for deletion or goes nowhere. Um, so you have, to, you have to be careful on these when you file them because who's responsible for this bug sometimes gets lost between the two different parties. It's worth filing for both parties, but you may wind up in a shouting match as to who's at fault. But just as a heads up, this is a, a difficult one. Last one are bugs that are really help requests. Um, these are particularly <coughs> annoying to a lot of the folks in this chain. It's, I don't know how this works, can you tell me how it works? Usually there's a far more appropriate channel for any of these out there. I really encourage you to try to find it. Sometimes there's not and the bug channel is the only one you have to report it back, but at least make a good solid stab at trying to figure out where it is through other channels before you report it into bugs. Um, so the sources of bug reports, who reports them? Number one on my list is internal reporters. Almost all of the, the great bug reports, not almost all, but a good portion of the great bug reports that I see through anyone came from people <coughs> who were within the company, within the organization. They're the first group. And most of the people in the company know that. So they're going to usually have an advantage in most bug systems. This is just something to know because if you can find someone within the company to file your bug report for, for you, it has a better chance of going somewhere or to look at your bug report and add their weight to it. Um, and part of this numbers is that as people are just thinking or spitballing or planning out a new feature, almost everything goes into the bug system. This is how most software development companies actually structure their work. So there's a lot of bugs. Um, another one that I know ha files an awful lot of bugs, especially at Apple, is automated testing systems. They're going along and they notice a crash, they try to figure out if it's a duplicate of one they've already seen. If not, it files it right into there. And the last one, unfortunately, on the line is you end users. Um, but it's just worth knowing that you're competing with other folks to get your bugs fixed. So. You really have to bear that in mind and make the best bug report because you've got a lot of competition ahead of you. Um, so the life of a bug report, once it's been filed by a user, first it goes to a screener. Um, this person is going to try to reproduce the bug and figure out whether it's valid, um, <coughs> maybe, f maybe try to reproduce it as in see it themselves. Uh, before sending it on to the scheduler. They're handing it over to someone, usually a manager, engineering manager, who prioritizes bugs and in turn moves them to developers' queues. And developers are the people who are actually going to fix the actual bug. So let's look at that process in a little more detail. First, the screener, as I said, they validate and regress the bug. And regression has a very specific meaning. It means it worked at one point, and if I go backwards in time, it stopped working. Or, uh, sorry, it stopped being a bug. Um, I said I was gonna talk a little bit more about this. Regressions are important both because we advertise it did this and now it doesn't, um, is a very important motivator for, say, marketing, which is, let's say, a powerful force at many companies. Um, and the second reason is that it's also fairly easy to take, uh, take two points in time within your code base and say, what are all the things that have changed in the code base from this point to that point? Severely limiting the amount of, of work you have to do to try to find where in the code that got put in. Um, which means it's a lot less frustrating for developers to correct the problem, usually. Um, the screener also finds all the duplicates. They screen out things that aren't valid, um, and aren't valid is a term of art, let's put it that way. It varies from person to person. The help requests and other things like that. Um, as I already alluded to already, they need to, in most cases, they need to reproduce the bug. So you need to give them all the tools you can to do so. Um, so, a screener gets a bug dropped on them. They then figure out, do I have everything I need to try to reproduce it or am I gonna go back to the reporter and go ask more questions about it? 
It, once they are satisfied they have everything they need, then it's either going to drop into the inbox for the, for the um, next person, or they're going to kill it right there. Um, and so for the screener, you're trying to get it into the inbox of the next person. Coincidentally, XKCD's comic for today is all about bugs. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not trying to pad out time or anything. I just thought it was way too timely not to share. Um, I've been in a couple of these conversations. <laughs> so reproducing bugs. A screener needs a clear, concise way of getting to this bug, assuming that's possible. Um, they need step-by-step -step instructions. I did this, then I did that, then I did this, then I did that. I expected to get A, but I got B. Um, this allows them to follow your line of thinking very clearly. Um, and assumptions are absolutely the enemy here. I'll give you an example from a few weeks ago. Um, I happen to be working on our database's import and export scripts. I'm redoing them, and so they're heavily in my mind. And they're heavily in the mind of my manager. So we got a bug uh, two weeks ago, something like that, um, that said, when I import all of my data into RethinkDB, memory shoots through the roof, it gets really slow, it shouldn't do this. You've got a leak, you've got a problem, fix it. Um, so, and it happened, we got a couple of other bugs in the, uh, the days before about possible memory leaks that we still haven't been able to reproduce. Um, but so we, both of us instantly thought, oh, what's wrong in, what's wrong in our importer? And since I've been working on it, I knew a bunch of problems and I thought, hmm, well, we're, it's possible that the, the importer has to read it off disk and it puts it into memory and then it feeds it to the actual RethinkDB process to, to save onto disk itself. Um, so, you know, looking at that one, it's using the wrong sort of multiprocessing queue and we could just be building up a huge one and it gets, gets huge. So I worked on that. I, I developed a beta version of our driver to try to figure out what his problem was, diagnose it, and try to fix it, and toss that back over the wall to him. And he ran it and, of course, had the exact same problem. Here's where he did something really nice that fixed the problem. <coughs> he gave me a screenshot of the memory problem he was having. I opened the screenshot and instantly went, oh, it's not the import script that's having the problem. It's the database that's having the problem. Totally different problem. Oh. He probably has it misconfigured. He, you know, we, we allow you to set how much memory it's going to use. He probably has it set for more memory than his computer has, and it just used it all up. Um, so I suggested that to him, and he closed the bug. So I presume that fixed it. <laughs> I don't know, which is a little bit of a problem, and I'm using the story for two purposes. The other one is, once you've solved your problem, record that, because I'm still thinking about that problem. It's not out of my head. That means that there's a little slice of my head that can't be used for fixing the next bug. Um, find the minimum reproducible case. So you're having some big problem, and you're, you, know, you do 40 things, and you get the problem. It may be that the bug only happens when you walk through those 40 steps. Can you walk to the bug in three? Um, ultimately, someone's going to have to do this, this step. The more steps there are in reproducing the bug, the more time it's going to take for someone else to do it, more likely that they're going to say, works for me, I can't reproduce it, and give up. So if you can take it and make it as small a target as possible, you've done some of their work for them, and they're probably going to be able to take it the rest of the way faster. Um, and maybe they'll take it the way, all the way when they wouldn't have. Um, more information is always better, so always include your hardware, your setting, your hardware information, your settings, all of that, even when it doesn't seem relevant. Um, there's surprising places where uh, you're having a graphics problem, and you know, it's graphics problem. It's graphics card specific. 
you're having a problem with this application and it's running out of memory. You're having a problem with mail.app and it turns out that it's because of a timing condition on your speed of processor. Um, I've seen all of these and I've seen even weirder ones. Um, I have kept my testing computer very constant at work because it just happened that my iMac reproduces all sorts of weird timing bugs that nothing else in the office does. One machine is this slightly faster, one machine is just slightly slower, but otherwise are identical. Don't show these bugs. Mine does, for whatever reason. Um, which is convenient because since I do QA a lot. <laughs> so, um, so, and again, I'm hammering on the regression thing. Is this new or when did it last work? Um, and can you reproduce this on someone else's setup? Not just someone else's machine, but something that's set up differently from how you set it up. If you set up 10 computers, they're likely to be similar. Can you reproduce it when someone else has set up the computer? Um, and ultimately, if you can script it, you will fly through the bug process. If you can script getting to that. Um, I've filed a few bugs uh, against disk utility and HDI util and things like that. That only happened one in 10 times, but I scripted it to do it a thousand times. So they could always see, see it. I handed that over. Um, while at Apple, I found one thing that was supposed to be producing JSON that wasn't truly producing JSON. Um, it produced JSON-like structures, but it used single quotes rather than double quotes, and that's illegal in JSON. <coughs> so I just handed them a script that, that showed that this was a problem. They said, thanks, fixed it, and they put my script in their regression tests. So that would never happen again. Um, so if you can provide them with a little more work, it's gonna go through faster. Oh, and that one, he came back to me that same day um, saying, thanks, we found it, we fixed it, because it was small. If I hadn't done that to them, they'd have been chasing it for a while. So log files are your friends. Um, this isn't a Finding Nemo, friend, uh, Nemo reference, but it's close. Um, so logs, of course, are in their log, um, sometimes in tilde logs. Um, and you can get that from console.app uh, if you don't want to go the command line route. Um, look for it. You should, as system administrators, you probably should be familiar with what a normal computer produces. So you can see what an abnormal system works. Um, if you can run, if you're running an app, if you can run it from the command line, it's a surprising number of them produce relevant output when run from the command line. Not all of them, and some of them don't work that way at all. Um, Mail.app happens to run it, and that's the path to give you an idea of what, a, what that might look like. Apple also likes using uh, kill minus user one as a way of causing the, the, the app to go into its debug mode. Sometimes there's even user two um, that does super debug mode. Um, that's often very, very verbose, but you can find things. Um, also, dash dash debug or dash dash verbose are other options that some apps do. Most of them will have this in their man page. Not all, but there are things you can try. There's also tilde library logs diagnostic reports. Crash reports will sometimes report in here. Um, in a similar library, crash reports from your iPhone will appear in here, so sometimes you can do those as well. Um, one other friend you can use is on macOS is SysDiagnose. It is both a four, f uh, one, two, three, four, five finger uh, salute on the computer um, that you can run at any time starting at boot. It will run a whole bunch of profilers, run a whole bunch of things, so it, it does take quite a bit of CPU on your computer. May run between two minutes on a fast machine and five on a slow. Actually, much longer if you're doing lots of symbolication. Um, but it's sort of an everything in the kitchen sink approach to figuring out what's going wrong. This is really important if your computer's hanging or freezing or something like that. A lot of times there's still some part of the process running underneath and you can get to it this way. Um, it's in ver temp, um, so not in private temp, but in private ver temp. Um, does system state, it does logs, it does configuration. Like I said, really everything in the kitchen sink. 
Um, interestingly, there's a command line version of it that you can also call, and it has a couple different modes. The more interesting one to me is that I can run it on a single process. Um, so you can, you can specify that process by PID. So if mail.app is hung and you're trying to figure out why, but you don't feel like sending them everything that's running on your system, you can run it just against that and report just that. Um, so what's life like as a screener? There is a tidal wave of bugs in a lot of places. Um, these folks are drowning. So, you know, try to be nice to them. Um, the, a lot of these bugs are invalid or incomplete, need to be sent back for more information or confusing. You know, sometimes intentional, well, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes not as unintentionally as I wish. Um, some of them are calling for tech support. They're doing all sorts of weird <laughs> things. And sometimes we'll get bug reports for someone else's product that has nothing to do with us. I don't understand why, but that happens. Uh, we're also buried under a lot of duplicates. Most bugs don't have duplicates, but those bugs that have duplicates wind up having an awful lot of them. A lot of people report the same issues, uh, and that's good. Um, this is especially true at Apple because radar is a one-way street. You submit the radar, you get to see a little bit of data about it, mostly whether it's open or closed, and no one else does. So no one else can, can see it. Yes, I do know about open radar, just one moment. Um, it's also an undervalued position in most organizations. This is the most junior person, often. Um, the person who doesn't have a CS degree, all sorts of things, they're often contractors. Some people in, in, this, in this part of QA are stellar, they're phenomenal, but most aren't. So just, just a heads up that you're trying to go through someone who may not have the understanding of the system that you do, even though they work on that team. Um, Um, the question is how much of the tier one uh, uh, screening is automated? Um, almost none of it, um, which is why you get such this. I mean, with chatbots in the next five years, that may change, but at the moment, uh, the o it's all someone with their, their, their butt in the seat, um, personally reading it. Um, and I do have some sympathy for these folks. I've never had directly this position, really, but I've met a lot of them. Um, I have some sympathy for them, but at other times I will call out Roku here. The guys at Roku are awful horrible. Um, <laughs> talk to me offline for that story. Um, so, and some of them are measured on, measured in their jobs for the number of bugs they get through per hour. That is their quality metric. Mm -hmm. You can just imagine that's not pushing them to do a good job on each individual bug. Mm -hmm. it, the difficult thing is it's really hard to because they're describing a situation. It's hard for a, for a screener to read someone else's mind sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, my example about the memory one. Okay, he wrote it without any intention of being confusing, but because of where we were, in our thinking, what projects we were working on, we thought of a different, totally different part of the system that was going wrong. And so it requires some domain specific knowledge on it. It requires figuring out what that person is trying to do with the, with the, with the product that may not be what's where the intention is. In fact, that's fairly common. Someone is doing something different, something creative with the product, and you have to, f to follow along. So, um, there's a little bit of the screening that maybe could be, but we very quickly veer off into areas that, that aren't gonna be automated for a long time. Um, there's also the difficulty of Heisen bugs, bugs that work once, or bugs that appear once, and then don't, 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 hi. Um, they're really, really, really difficult to diagnose, they're really difficult to fix, all that, and oftentimes the screeners are the ones who are asked to do it initially. And if a developer can't do it, it's often the same pool of screeners who will come back and try it again. Um, and I, I just had one more thing, so I put, or it's broken. 
Um, this is a, a form of bad bug report. Don't ever use the phrase, it's broken anywhere in your bug reports. That's a useless <laughs> phrase. I see it all the time. <laughs> so to give you an idea of this tidal wave of bugs, um, I went and, and asked uh, uh, the, guy at uh, the guy who's managing Open Radar if he wouldn't mind sharing their cache of, of radars. And so I went and I filtered it for all sorts of bad data that they had in there. And I recorded the number of bugs submitted to Apple, or number of bugs recorded by Apple um, over time. Starting in 2007, you're seeing every month up until last month of 2016. The reason I have access th to this, um, which you know, you'd say that's Apple proprietary stuff, is because Radar records all bugs with a sequential number. So all I need is one per month, and I've got a good idea how many bugs they've had. Um, so you can see right now <coughs> they're getting um, about 500 bugs, uh, 500,000 bugs a month. That translates into almost 18,000 bugs a day. Now, I need to cut this number down a little bit. I figure about half of these are um, sub are automated submissions, or someone at Apple went to Radar and they hit Apple, Apple N to get a new document and then never actually used it. That actually, right there, that burns a Radar number. Surprising number of people walk into work every day, open Radar, and go N, 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 N. I don't understand it, but they do. Um, so, you know, a lot of, I, I figure about half of these are, are totally invalid. You know, no one spent a lot of time working on them. I figure about two thirds of the ones left are internal Apple bugs. In fact, if you notice, about three months ago, you notice that big spike in the number of bugs. I would bet you that's that's as Apple's latest OS was released internally to their own testers. I, I I didn't look that that much. If if you wanna wanna look at the month on that, I've got the raw data. Um, but uh, basically, I want you to take two things from this slide. One, it's going up, and two, from the number, eighteen thousand bugs a day. That's a big number. Um, so when I say folks are drowning, I'm not kidding. Um, so what can you do to get screener bliss? What can you do to get through, make the screener happy and you to get your bug through? Okay, <coughs> search for answers on forums first. Search for a proper forum to ask your question. If you can do so, you're just reducing the number of, of bugs, especially help me bugs, that make it into the system. Um, so don't use this, this particular channel as a helpline. Um, know where your bug reproduces. Does it reproduce only on this machine? Does it do it on that machine? Does it do it on OS you know, A or OS B? Um, which version of the product were you using? If you're doing a mail client, against what mail servers are you doing it? Can you, can you provide the versions of the mail servers? Um, and more importantly, show where it doesn't reproduce as well, because that will give them a search area to look in. Um, short, clear summary. Okay, I've, I've told you already that you should put a ton of data into this one. S I'm still saying that, I'm not contradicting myself there. But right at the top, one paragraph that says, what is your problem? Okay, what, what are you having an issue with? Then go into all the details. Um, there's a bunch of people who are gonna read this, possibly. Do you want a bunch of people to read it? And the less they have to read to get to your idea, the better. Um, Step-by-step -step instructions. I'm giving the ideas of pictures or videos or scripts. Um, sometimes, like, like in this example I gave where someone gave me a screenshot of their pro of PS Top, um, sometimes that will take the assumptions that you're making that, that the other side isn't and help clear those up. Um, the video one, there's not many places that accept video, but if you can do it, a walkthrough video on YouTube or something like that, this is how I get there, is gonna take all those assumptions and just pave them right over. 
Um, so include logs, hardware profiles, et cetera. Um, if you use the, the system profiler, that's great. Um, there's lots of other, other things you can accumulate into there. The more information you give, the less time they're gonna have to come back to you, the quicker you're gonna make it through the screener. So once it's through the screener, it goes to the scheduler. And I was very happy again with our artist. She, she did this nice little image for me. Um, the scheduler is normally the engineering manager and they decide when a bug will be looked at um, and looked at by a developer and they're juggling a lot of priorities. They've got to report to their management, you know, to drive sales, to get more features, to do all those things. And they've also got to make the engineers happy while they're trying to make the users happy. Um, I did this job for just a little while at Apple and I didn't like it at all. Um, personal preference. <coughs> um, so they get a bug in from the screener and they've got basically two decisions to make. They can choose to say this is invalid, we're not gonna do this. A screener doesn't say we're not gonna do this for a new feature. That's not the screener's job. The scheduler may well say, we're just not gonna do this, you're dead. Um, otherwise, they're gonna put it into one of three buckets usually. Now, soon, or later. Um, different companies use different names for these. Um, and sometimes they have four or five buckets or all sorts of things. But they usually wind up acting as if there's three buckets. Now, this is where the developers work. If you've got an urgent, you know, it ate my kitten sort of bug, th it goes into now, alongside of all the work for the, the current development milestone, what the next version that's gonna go out is. Soon, this is stuff, we think it's a good idea, we really wanna do it, but it doesn't fit into our current work milestone. So we drop it into this one, and this is what gets reviewed when we move on to the next milestone. Later, this is the graveyard of good ideas. There are a ton of bugs that go into this. Um, and in most cases, it means it's never, ever, ever going to be implemented. That doesn't mean it doesn't record it, and it's not a good idea to report it, <coughs> but it's a worrisome thing. Or, but there's a good chance. You do have one saving grace on this one, and I'll get to that in a moment. So the responsibility is, is to keep the execs, developers, and users happy. Uh, they maintain the plan for this particular component of the software going forward. They're sort of the keepers of the flame for this idea, the broad idea on it. And they're the guys who, just, who get to decide what goes forward and what doesn't. Um, what doesn't is usually the far tougher choice because no one can ever estimate software development. I've heard tons of people say they can, I've yet to find one who can <coughs> actually do it and actually hit a milestone. Um, so the other thing to know in this one is the more time they spend working on the bugs, the less time they can spend working on the features and features are what sells the next version of the software, okay? So your bug has to be important enough that it's going to beat out a feature for the next cycle. Um, your bug may be small, it may be huge. Often those are tough to estimate. Um, and like I say, it is a black art that I have yet to see anybody master. Um, there, lots of money gets spent trying to make it look like people mastered it. I've yet to see that actually happen. Um, usually the way they master it is by right towards the end, cutting everything off and saying, we finished it. Um, this is one of the reasons Apple does not talk about future, uh, future, future features, because Apple works on a ton of features that either never make it into a product or get moved to the next version. Um, so the schedule also conducts bug scrubs and, and during both feature planning they're gonna go through all of those, all the ones that they have in, uh, in soon. They're gonna go through those and promote those to now. Um, and they also go through, occasionally, they go through the graveyard, through later, and see if there's something that 
either doesn't fit with the product anymore and can now be killed, or eh, let's promote that one to soon. Um, so there are times when things get moved up. How can you make these people happy? Again, a short, clear summary. These people look <coughs> at a ton of bugs, and they're not going to look at them just once. They're going to look at them every cycle. They're going to look at a, some subset of these bugs. Um, so if you have that short paragraph at the beginning that tells them what they really need to know, they can read, especially the first sentence, and they'll go, oh yeah, I remember that one. Maybe that one gets in. Um, so you also should put fairly far up, uh, fairly close to the beginning, some sort of impact indication. So this is impacting all 5,000 of my users, okay? This is costing us an hour of time for every one of them for every week. So the screener doesn't care about that information. The developer probably doesn't care about that information. But the scheduler can use that as a bat to get more resources allocated to this one. So if you can give impact information, you may just give them the tools they need to get one more developer put onto this, to get this one in, even though they're getting the feature XYZ in as well. Um, additionally, this is where duplicate bugs are actually used. Um, some engineering managers look at the duplicate counts to, to judge impact. That means that multiple people looked at this. This is a hit or miss thing. Some of them don't, some of them do, some of them really don't care. Um, so don't be discouraged from filing duplicates too much. I wanna discourage you a little bit because then you're overloading the screener. If you can even file one that says, like radar, give a number because someone else has told it to you, that one flies through the screener. They mark it as duplicate, they're done, moved on. Um, but it's still gonna show up as a duplicate for, the, for those engineering managers who are looking for that information. And for them, regressions are usually the enemy. Regressions are their team screwed up and they wanna fix it. So regressions usually get scheduled ahead of almost everything else. Um, so on to developers. Um, they fix bugs, <laughs> it sounds sort of stupid. And they're the ones who create new ones too. Um, they, uh, so they get a bug in from, so a now bug in from their manager. They're gonna pump it through Xcode and finally, they might make a regression <coughs> test. A regression test is a test to see if this ever fails again in the future, if the developers ever make this sort of mistake again. This is one of the things I like the most, mostly because I'm in, in uh, testing automation, so regressions are my, regression tests are my bread and butter. Um, this means that it's never gonna happen again because these get run before release and so hopefully the regression test will find it. Uh, usually they send the bugs, once they're done with them, usually they send the bugs back to the screeners who verify that for the cases they found it failed in, that the developer has fixed it. Um, I've multiple times um, in sort of a screening role found, some, found bugs again and Apple actually if you initiate a bug, you are the screener for that bug. Um, I found multiple times that someone corrected it for their system or for their cases and they missed it for mine. Um, this is pretty common. So hopefully you got good, hopefully you've got some good screeners and they're doing a good job on this. And finally, then the screener is gonna send it back to the originator if you're the originator. Life of a developer. Well, there's plenty of uh, snacks and caffeine in the kitchen. Um, that's pretty common. Um, they work on what's in now, mostly. Here's that, that little saving grace. When a developer is working in a particular area in the code, they often will know that there's a few things in this component that they thought was a good idea, but their management didn't. Um, so, well, while I'm in the neighborhood, I'm gonna fix those three bugs as well. 
So sometimes they get folded into here. So the lesson to learn out of this one is you want to make sure that your wording on yours appeals to the developer. In many cases, especially at Apple, the developers working in this area is the one who created the code initially, they created the tool, and may have even proposed that tool to begin with. Um, so keep in mind that they have, a, they have a vision for it that may or may not be shared by management, and if you can give them a bug that gets through the system, even if it doesn't get scheduled by a manager, they may just slide it in. Um, a lot of things get done this way. Um, and I see this as good, I see this as a good practice from management because they're making the developers happy. This is the little bone you give them. Um, now, again, you can only fix what you can reproduce. If you can't see a bug, the chances that you can fix it are close to zero um, because you never know whether you fixed it or not. Um, a case in this one, um, our database went through the Jepson tests not too, uh, not too long ago. Um, for those of you who don't know, Jepson are really, really tough tests for NoSQL databases. Um, and we went through the first phase of it with flying colors and we got to the second one. And the guy who does the Jepson tests is really good. He found a bug in our system. But it, with the best systems we had to reproduce it, working the hardest we could, we could only get it to reproduce every second day. Um, it was really, really a nasty bug. And this one was really tough to reproduce. Ultimately, we figured out it, and we now have a test that can reproduce it in a minute because we absolutely know where the bug is, and that meant we could actually fix it. But our engineering team, three people, spent two weeks trying to find this bug because we knew it was there. We could see it in the test results, but no one could figure out what the path through the code to get there was um, because we had made one small assumption that turned out to be wrong. Um, so there's also, I said, there's works on 17. This, I, I don't know if anybody has heard this one, but it was a really common phrase, at least internally at Apple, about Active Directory problems. Apple is one of the few organizations on the earth that has a class A subnet. That means anything that starts with an IP address of 17 dot is an Apple address. And so what this really means is that it works, it works on Apple's computers. <laughs> um, it's really another way of saying it works for me. Um, a lot of problems don't reproduce really well unless you've really nailed what the environmental conditions are. Um, for instance, a lot of the Active Directory things were either DNS related or were because someone was using a dot .local in your network and that didn't play nicely. Um, Another big problem, one that I ran into a lot at Apple, in fact, I was the guy keeping all the hardware, was how do I get a hold of this piece of hardware? Uh, this is even worse on the Windows side, but Apple has, surprisingly, a lot of different variants of their hardware. Um, I kept a lab, a very large lab, that had a very large number of computers, and one of the purposes was so that I had at least one of everything. Um, from OpenGL's OpenCL's perspective. I didn't from the CPU <coughs> perspective, so another lab needed to handle that. Um, but I know that um, those engineers who didn't know about my lab had a lot of problems within our organization trying to reproduce all sorts of weird bugs. We were graphics card oriented, so I had just stacks of graphics cards that I could swap into those computers that could swap stuff. Um, and I also want to reiterate that developers are usually the keeper of the flame on the component that we're talking about. They're the people who are emotionally invested in this component being good. They're probably frustrated that they don't get to spend enough time on this component. Um, so if your bug can get them a little more time on it, they're probably happy to do that. Um, and if they can sneak it in, they probably will. Um, and so I'm trying to say, if you can figure out what that developer really likes, play to it. 
So what makes a developer happy? Beyond the caffeine and the snacks, um, clear reproducibility on the bug. And the holy grail on this one is usually a script. If you can produce a script that does it, you've just made everybody in this entire process really happy. A regression history. This means he has a lot less haystack to sift through to find this bug. And again, it fits their view of this product. If you're asking them to do something totally different, you're probably gonna get a little pushback from them. If their manager decides that it's gonna happen, it's probably gonna happen, whether it's them or someone else doing it. And so a chart, and I'm doing this more for uh, PDFs and slides on it, <coughs> this sort of shows the process that I've just outlined. Um, and notice, soon and later, do not go to code. Um, I was really thinking about putting later as a appendage of the graveyard, but the last minute decided not to. <laughs> so, how is Apple different? Opacity. You don't know what Apple's doing. Once you submit a bug to Apple, you get very little feedback usually, sometimes a request for more feedback, um, and sometimes it's just duplicate or closed because I was closing a whole bunch of bugs, which I have actually had at Apple once. Um, but uh, you can't see a lot. In comparison to my current job, we're open source, you can see everything. You can see our conversations online, you can see everything. So those sort of form the two ends of the spectrum about what you might be able to see. Apple is, is almost the most opaque um, company in this regard. Again, scale, 18,000 bugs a day. Um, I bet you Microsoft's in this realm and a few other large companies are in this realm. Few people are. Um, and because of that scale, they have Apple developer relations. The screener that in in my company's case is sort of sh split between me and the engineering manager taking that role. Um, Apple has an entire organization that is your initial screener. They do the initial screens to make sure it l smells like a bug. Then it goes to a second screener within the engineering organization that it, that's been dropped into. Um, and Apple has lots of little fiefdoms I mean, a lot of little fiefdoms. And some of those fiefdoms are black holes within black holes, meaning a lot of the bugs anyone at Apple can see. Others of them, especially the iOS ones, they're in a, a second level of black hole that you can't see. Um, there's also multiple <coughs> testing groups within Apple, each for their own little domain. S part of this is just Apple splitting up the work and usually this works out very well. Um, in some cases, it actually leads to more confusion on bugs. I remember a few years ago, um, there was a bug in the graphics card switching on the MacBook Pros, um, where you'd get system corruption and reboots and all of that. That one actually, I was incidental in, in that investigation. Um, but that one w wound up happening because it fell between two different testing domains. People were responsible for when the cards were in this mode, people were ex responsible for when they were in this mode, nobody was really responsible for swapping back and forth. Um, that, is, that particular hole has been fixed, but eventually there'll be something like that. Um, and they're also unique partially because of the way Steve Jobs drove the company and the culture that he instilled into the company, upper management functions as a keeper of the flame. They're the ones who insist on, on their vision of the product being carried forward. Now, they do it in very broad strokes, but in many other companies, upper management is less involved in this except in strategic decisions. Um, in Apple's, it's slightly more operational in nature. Um, it tends to produce good results, but it means that there's a whole lot of things that just aren't going to happen because, that would happen otherwise, because upper management has decided we're not gonna do that direction. Um, it's, it's both good and bad, but it's something to be aware of. Primarily if you submit any bugs that relate to 
oh, the GUI should look like this, probably not gonna happen. Um, so best practices. Like I've been saying all along, a small summary. The faster you can get to the, your point, your, your main point, the better. Step-by-step um, -step instructions, because there's two different people in this chain, at least, who have to reproduce your bug, often multiple times. Uh, please include impact in it, how this affects you, and how many people within your organization this affects, because sometimes that can be a bat for people to swing. Um, and do include how badly, be really honest about this, don't try to inflate it, because if you try to inflate it, they're gonna go, eh, he's trying to cheat. Zzz. Um, include regression information. Did it ever work? Uh, what versions, on what hardware, etc. cetera. Uh, throw in the kitchen sink, give everything you can the first time around. Um, it's a lot of, for someone to wade through, but they don't need to wade through it if they don't need to wade through it. And if they have it right <laughs> there in front of them, they're not gonna have to send it back to you and you'll be back in their back of their review queue. Um, s include everything that's relevant about your environment. You know, are you using Active Directory? Are you, you know, are you using OD? What, you know, what sorts of things are on your network? There's weird cases where all of this really matter. And more often than not, there's cases where it seems obvious to people in there that that was what you really needed to have and it's not included. And that's just gonna slow everything down because it has to go back to you and it's back in the back of the queue again. Um, and finally, if you don't radar it, then it never happened. This is a phrase I've heard many times, both internally at Apple and elsewhere. If you don't tell Apple about the problem, Apple doesn't know. They aren't gonna fix it. They have no chance of fixing it. If they know, they might not fix it anyways, but if they don't know, they definitely aren't gonna fix it. Um, so that uh, concludes uh, my slides. Um, do you have questions that I might be able to answer? Yes, sir. What's the purpose of Apple's behavior? It Qu seems as, you know, like it fights the purposes of bug reporting and fixing. The, the okay. What's the purpose of Apple's opaqueness? It seems like it fights against bugs and reporting and fixing. Bugs are probably a unintended side consequence of it. Um, my interpretation, uh, not I can't claim to be the voice of Apple in any way, shape, or form on this one, is it serves a, a few different purposes. One of them, Apple can cancel any project at any time before it ships with no one the wiser. Okay, they can, they do. I've been involved in a number of canceled projects. Um, the Apple spent a lot of resources in these projects and then killed it at the last moment, you know, to the point where there was a couple of WWDCs where I was sitting in, it, Apple screens them internally at Apple, wondering whether we were gonna be killed or not. Um, so it allows Apple to do that and not offend people when their pet doesn't ship. Um, external people, internal people get very offended by it. Um, so there is that component of it. There's also the wow factor, which Apple marketing loves, and it looks like it's effective to me. I don't know. Um, I'm not in marketing, so I really can't tell you that. <laughs> um, but it looks like it's effective to me. So I think for those things, it is very effective for Apple. Um, it hurts uh, large organizations in terms of planning. Although, to be honest, Apple's gonna have an iMac and you can go look at the pricing <laughs> sheets and you can <laughs> bet that they'll have an iMac at about that price next year and an iMac at about the price the next year. There are exceptions, Xserve being an obvious one. Um, but if you're an Apple criminologist, then those are usually pretty well telegraphed years in advance. They're not completely clear, but you know you should be moving somewhere else or getting your options open. 
Um, I sort of over talked that one, but did I hit, hit an answer for you? Yeah, I just get frustrated. I almost don't want to file the reports because I'll never hear anything and never know. And that, That's why I'm doing this one. Yeah. File them. It's frustrating, I know. Um, but if you don't file them, it didn't happen. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Thank you. That's good. Um, I'm really glad you're here and you're presenting on this. Um, I've actually submitted only one bug report um, to Apple. I did that in April. I heard back in May. And um, because of the nature of the bug report is a security issue that I guess I had discovered and very precisely documented. Um, you know, it, it's clear that it's reproducible. And I received a single uh, comment, one line response um, two weeks later, which is, do you intend to publish this? And uh, I just wanted to see if you had any insights, because I got the shivers from that. Okay, I have never worked in Apple security. I have never been, re with the exception that they had a nice conversation with me when I became an Apple Windows sysadmin. Uh, Apple internal security <laughs> had a nice long conversation with me. Um, uh, with that exception, I, I've, I have very little insight directly into that one. Um, obviously, they were, they were looking to see whether they had a timeline um, about publishing. Mm -hmm. um, I would refer you to, the f to Google the phrase responsible disclosure to see the conversation there. Um, so uh, I don't want to ask whether they fixed it or not. If you feel that it is a valid security concern, um, one of the things I forgot to put in my slides, so thank you for the question, mm -hmm. um, is if you don't get any traction on something that you feel needs traction through radar, mm -hmm. there's an Apple SC s sitting right there. <laughs> um, there. There is an Apple engineering, I engineering folks presenting, at least two of them, one in security. Actually, yeah, that's the person to go to right now. Um, there's someone, is it right now, giving a talk on Apple security? Um, I understand it's a woman presenting. That was this yeah, morning? Okay. Okay. Um, so the, the, that's the specific for right now. But the broader one is find someone at Apple. Yeah. The closer you can find to that group in engineering, yeah. the, the better it is. But anyone at Apple is a step better than, bug, than radar. Like I said, I okay. did actually have one bullet point that said, you know, internal ones are, are usually favored over external. Okay, and are you Apple people going to give me any information? No, they, um, mm -hmm. they likely, especially in security, that's one of the black holes, mm -hmm. they likely have no access at all to that bug. Um, but they can talk to people who, they, they're people who knows peoples, okay? Um, and that's what you're going for. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I have one question and also one comment. I did submit a few security bugs to, to Apple and sometimes it's kind of like that you you hear and the, the reason they ask is, I guess, for um, the timing of when they're, they're going to fix it or whatever, but I felt like you don't hear a lot back and then eventually they just, they'll probably send you an email saying, oh, it's fixed in the latest beta. Can you, can you check it out or something can like that? Can you confirm? Yeah. Can you confirm it's fine, but uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, communications there, but yeah. That's how it is right now. So my, my question was on the on the security side, have you personally worked with um, like bug bounty services like Bug Crowd and Hacker One, where you have like a huge pool of people trying to find bugs? I have not. Um, I, uh, we a coworker and I did also submit one an Apple sec Apple security. It happened to be in the curl library. It's curl library interface to Apple security, um, and uh, I'm afraid to say last I checked. They had not not patched it, although curl has has verified and patched it for us. Well, actually, we submitted what the patch was, but details. Um, uh, Apple just hasn't picked up that one. It's a very narrow one, but um, I have not done the bug bounty ones. I that whole responsible disclosure one. I am very ambivalent about what that means. Yeah, no, I don't think we need to have that claim or. Right yeah, there's not enough people. I, I'm I'm personally <laughs> it's gonna be I'm personally fight. conflicted. Let alone the wider discussion. Yeah. All right. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you for coming and, and sitting with us. Uh, I actually have finished one in time.